and team for a wonderful night of, of worship this evening. We're so glad that, that you're here this evening. Tonight I want to talk about one word, just one simple word, and I'll try to be brief this evening, and it's the word grace this evening. Grace that is found in the Christmas story. So did you ever see something or someone that seemed to be completely out of place? You saw something and you thought, that just doesn't belong there. Its participation, its presence, its appearance just seemed to be completely inappropriate. Let me show you a couple of just simple pictures and you'll notice what's out of place, what's inappropriate right away. Notice the first picture. Notice what's inappropriate, there's one red ball in a sea of blue balls. You look at that and you wonder, what in the world is that red ball doing there? Here's a different picture. All right, so in a movie theater, all kinds, all the seats are the same, and all of a sudden there's a toilet seat right there. You'd sit back and you think, that is completely inappropriate. That just doesn't belong there. How about this? Now, in South Florida, we might understand this, but from Ohio, where I'm from, we're not. So, so a Christmas tree out of a palm tree. Has anybody ever done that, by the way, before? Maybe somebody's done that. I mean, for those that aren't from South Florida, they would sit back and think, boy, that's just not right. That's inappropriate. And here's one final example that doesn't make any sense to me. A skinny, beardless Santa Claus. I'd never seen one of those before. I sit back and look at that guy and think, that's just... There's just not, there's something that's not right about that, right? Just completely inappropriate. Here's what I want us to see tonight. The gospel is a lot like those pictures. You see, what I mean by that is this, that Jesus' birth clearly shows that God is all about including those who just don't seem to fit. Does that make sense? Aren't you glad that we all don't have to fit into one mold? That we all don't have to be exactly alike? That God doesn't just pick and choose and accept people who are of a certain way? Matthew chapter 1 tells us the story of Jesus' birth. And maybe some of you will be reading that with your families later this evening or tomorrow morning. It also gives for us the family tree of Jesus, the genealogy, as it were, of Jesus. And as we read through those names in Matthew chapter 1, before we get to the description of Jesus' birth, and by the way, Matthew does that because Matthew is establishing the fact that only Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of David. So he goes through and, goes through and proves that from a genealogical point of view. But as you go through and you read every single one of those names, if you pay attention to those names, there are at least four names which don't seem to fit. As a matter of fact, you'd look at those names and you would say, hold on, time out. What are those names doing in the genealogy, the ancestry list of Jesus Christ, the Messiah? I want us to notice those four names this evening. I want to read just a few verses from Matthew chapter 1. If we can put the verses up on the screen. Matthew chapter 1, and we'll read just the first six verses of Matthew chapter 1. And I think you're going to notice the names. I think we've actually highlighted them. But I want you to see, so, so these are just a bunch of names. So, so, so bear with me as I read through these names for just a moment. Matthew 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Let me pause there. I think we have that. Well, we didn't highlight that verse. By, by Tamar. Tamar, by the way, was a woman. There are four women listed in this genealogy. I'm going to make reference to all of them. And Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, the second woman. And Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, the third woman. 
and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king, and David the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, the fourth woman. As you read through those, and I want to take just a few moments tonight and highlight the stories of those four women. Because those four women teach us two things, not only about Jesus' birth, but they teach us two things about the truth of the gospel that are relevant, extremely relevant to each and every one of us here this evening. The first is this, God's grace is greater than your sin. Let me say that again. God's grace is greater than your sin. You might be here tonight and you might say, Brian, you have no idea. As a matter of fact, no one has any idea what I've done, what my lifestyle is like. God knows. And I'm here to tell you tonight that there is nothing that you could have done in the past or that you might do in the future that would eliminate you from the grace and the love of God. We see that here in Matthew chapter 1. The first two women that I mentioned, let me just tell you their stories very quickly. Tamar is the first woman that's mentioned in Matthew's genealogy. Hers is a story of desperate hope. She was the daughter-in-law of Judah, who was one of Jacob's sons. She actually married both of Judah's sons. She married one, he died, and then she married the other. Both of them were bad men who God killed as an act of judgment. Judah then promised to give her to his youngest son once he came of age. A promise, by the way, that he never ever intended to keep. Hoping instead that Tamar would just go away and die a widow's death. Tamar's plight was desperate, especially in Old Testament Israel, especially for a woman who was childless. There was basically no hope for her. So here's what Tamar did. She took matters into her own hands. She disguised herself as an immoral woman. I'll use generic terms tonight because this is a family service. She disguised herself as an immoral woman and had relations with her father-in-law, who had promised his youngest son to her. As a result of that relationship, she bore him twin sons. One of the two of those twin sons was named Perez, who is found here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I would, would listen to that story, and we would, we would judge her behavior, and we would classify her, we would characterize her with all kinds of names as an immoral woman, and yet she is found in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The second woman that's mentioned is a woman by the name of Rahab. Unlike Tamar, Rahab was an actual woman of ill repute. The book of Judges tells us that clearly. She wasn't pretending to be one. She was actually one. She lived in the doomed city of Jericho. But recognizing the God of Israel as the one true sovereign of heaven and earth, Rahab made a separate peace with the people of Israel and with God. You might know the story. She sheltered the Israelite spies and helped them to escape, asking only that she and her family be spared in return. As a public token of her allegiance, she hung a scarlet cord outside of the window of her house in plain view of her own people so that everyone within her house would be spared by the advancing armies. I mentioned those two ladies this evening because both Tamar and Rahab are examples of God's grace. You and I would sit back and think in a perfect world that, that, that God would have made sure that every person in his son's genealogy had a perfect life, that they were spotless, that they were as close to holy as they possibly could. And yet God in his grace not only redeems these two ladies, but he includes them in the genealogy 
of his son. And they were descendants of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because of grace. You see, the birth of Jesus described here in, in Matthew chapter 1 is an act, it's a demonstration of God's grace. John, writing about the arrival of Jesus, says this, and the, world, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Notice how John describes Jesus, full of grace. Sometimes in our world, we have a misconception of Jesus and Christianity in the Bible. We think that, that Jesus and Christianity in the Bible is nothing more than a, than a book of rules and regulations that, that tells us what we can and cannot do. And yet, quite frankly, that is the opposite of who God is. Yes, there are rules and regulations, but God, <coughs> excuse me, in his love, reaches out and demonstrates grace to each and every one of us. It's the Apostle Paul who said this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. You see, the simple truth this evening is this. Your sin is no match for God's grace. God's grace is greater than all of your sins. God's grace is greater than your worst sin. As a matter of fact, on your very worst day, you cannot escape, you cannot run away from the grace of God. Do you ever feel like you're beyond God's grace? Do you ever feel like God just doesn't care for you and God just doesn't love you and maybe you've lived in such a way that maybe you're not worthy of Him reaching out to you? Be assured this evening, that he has enough grace to cover, he has enough grace to pay, and he has enough grace to forgive all of your sins. Tamar and Rahab show us that God's grace is greater than your sin. But there's a second truth that we see here in Matthew chapter 1, and it's this. Jesus offers hope and salvation to everyone. Jesus offers hope and salvation to everyone. We could say that about Tamar and about, about Rahab as well, but we see that specifically about Ruth and of the wife of Uriah the Hittite. For the last month here at HCC, if you, if you attend our Sunday services, we've been walking through the book of Ruth and we've talked about studying the story of Christmas with a twist this year. And so rather than looking at the incarnation and rather than looking at just the story of Christmas, we've, we've trotted back to the Old Testament and we've, we've tried our best to prove that the birth of Jesus, the story of Christmas, is not just a New Testament event, it is a whole Bible event. And God has planned, had planned, did plan the arrival of Jesus from the very foundation of the world. And not only do the stories of the New Testament show that to us, but the stories of the Old Testament show that to us as well. Specifically the story of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite widow who had married into a Jewish family. She had lost everything with the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. When her mother-in-law Naomi decided to return to Moab, to the land of Judah, Ruth was determined to accompany her. And so she chose to go back to Israel. She chose the God of Israel over the gods of the Moabites. Like Boaz's mother, Rahab, she belonged to a people not accepted by the Israelites in the Old Testament. She was a Moabite. And yet by faith, she became a woman of God whose character, the book of Ruth tells us, whose character put most men in Israel to shame. Her place in the Lord's ancestry speaks volumes about God's grace in redeeming outsiders and the joy which redemption brings. There's a fourth lady. Maybe you're familiar with this story. Maybe you're not. She's not named here in Matthew chapter 1. She's simply called the wife of Uriah the Hittite. The wife of Uriah the Hittite. Her name was Bathsheba. If Ruth's is the most heartwarming romance recorded in the Bible, 
then Bathsheba's is the most heartbreaking romance recorded in Scripture. Her romance, instead of being built on kindness and respect, is more like a modern Hollywood love story rooted in lust and infidelity. As I mentioned, Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. They weren't Israelites. She wasn't an Israelite. Uriah was one of King David's most trusted military officers. One day, David spotted Bathsheba bathing on the roof of his palace, and he took her to himself. As a result, David murdered her husband to cover up his illicit affair. The baby born of their union died as a consequence of God's judgment on their sinful relationship. So, so here's what I want you to see without getting into all the specifics of that story. Both of these women, Ruth and Bathsheba, were foreigners. They, they, they were outside of the family of Israel. They were outside of what we would call the covenant of grace. They had no rightful claim to be a descendant of the coming Messiah. Completely undeserving of God's grace. Yet their presence in Jesus' genealogy shows us that Jesus offers hope and salvation to anyone. Listen, here's what I'm saying this evening. That's the true meaning of Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. And we can talk about the fact that Christmas is about family and you're going to meet with family later today and tomorrow and Christmas is about giving and receiving and who doesn't like Christmas, who doesn't like giving and receiving and Christmas is about eating and all of those things. But in a very real sense, Christmas is about the grace of God. As he looked down not just on four women who were undeserving, but he looked down on you and on me who were also undeserving and demonstrated grace to us and offers us what we could never, ever, ever have earned on our own. So my challenge is this. If you're here today and you feel like an outsider, you feel like the gospel and you just don't fit together, you might be here today and you say, Brian, I'm, I'm just not a church person. I, I, I'm here on Christmas Eve, but that's just really not me. Nobody would really describe me as a religious person. And so the gospel and me, we just don't fit together. Maybe you're here and you're doubtful that God even cares for you. Be assured of the fact that Jesus' birth demonstrates you are important to him. I love the words of Paul in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 where Paul simply says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You're a smart bunch. What does the word everyone mean? Everyone. Would that include Tamar? who had had an illicit relationship with her father-in-law? Absolutely. Would that include Rahab, who was a woman of ill repute? Absolutely. Would that include Ruth, who was a foreigner, undeserving of being included in the covenant family of God? Absolutely. Would it include the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who had an illicit affair with David? Absolutely. Would it include you? Absolutely. Does it include me? Thank God I'm included in that. All right, if anybody would have said no, I would have got scared right there, all right? Here's what, I, here's what we see in the story. God's grace is greater than your sin. And Jesus, in his birth, in his life, in his death, offers salvation to everyone. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life, I'm not asking you whether you attend church on a regular basis. I'm not asking you whether you're, you're Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or Episcopalian. I'm not asking you any of those things, but I'm saying this. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life 
when you've repented of your sin and you've realized that, you're, that you desperately need Jesus and his grace and you've never reached out to him by faith, I would encourage you to do that today. Even right where you are, in your heart of hearts, you could pray this prayer, God, I know I'm a sinner. You know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. I believe that Jesus died for me. Please, I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to be my personal Savior. And if you will take a step of faith like that, you too can experience the grace of God. And as believers, those of us who have already experienced that, those who are recipients of God's grace, we should be what? We should be the greatest demonstrators of God's grace. Let's be gracious to everyone this Christmas season. Would you stand with me as we have a word of prayer tonight? Father, thank you so much for Jesus. And Lord, quite frankly, the verses we read and the four stories we talked about are not about Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba. All four of those stories are about Jesus because their inclusion and in the ancestry and the genealogy of Jesus would not be possible if Jesus did not come for the purpose of rescuing and saving and redeeming those who were lost. And we take hope in their story because their story is very similar to our story. Like them, we're in desperate need of God's grace. So I pray this Christmas season, as an act of faith, where those who have never placed their faith and trust in you would reach out to you and accept you as their personal Savior. And Lord, for those of us who already claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, help us to live out the truth of the gospel Help us to be the most accepting. Help us to be the most loving, the least judgmental, the least condemning. As we meet with family and friends the next few days, help us to exude the love, the grace of Jesus Christ to others. Help us to truly be the light of the world. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We could dim the lights, guys. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 12, he said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Our elders are going ahead and they're helping the to light candles, and we're going to light candles all throughout the auditorium tonight, symbolizing the fact that as representatives of Jesus Christ, we're shining not our light, but we are reflecting His light through us. He desires for us to shine the light of His love into a dark world. So let's do that, not just by our candles today, but let's do that by our actions as well. Let's sing together as we light the candles and we conclude this evening, Silent Night.